Um, was the dominant foreign language gtm actually grammar translation method or grammar method of teaching was the dominant foreign language teaching method in europe from the 1840s to the 1940s and it is still used so this is one of the significant uh, important aspects of um, language teaching where you know such an old method that was established during these times is still in use especially in the the context of the parts of the world like pakistan it is still predominantly used to teach english however even as an early as the mid 19th theorists were beginning to question the principles of grammar method of teaching a greater demand for the ability to speak foreign languages uh, had started emerging over the scenes there were various reformers who began reconsidering the nature of language and the nature of learning as well for example there were two french men who played an important role in this regard uh, whose names were c marcel and f goin there was an english man t pendergast as well who played a critical role in this regard these were the people who concluded that the way that children learned language was relevant to how adults should also learn language so you know the way a child learns l1 uh, the same should be replicated the same should be imitated or followed when it comes to the teaching and learning of l2 marcel emphasized the importance of understanding meaning in language learning process and um, pendergast proposed the first structural syllabus he proposed arranging grammatical structures to teach easiest as the first choice and gradually moving from the easiest to the difficult ones as far as the contribution of goin is concerned he believed that children learn language through using language for a sequence of related actions and he emphasized presenting each item in context thus contextualization became important and uh, he emphasized using gestures to supplement verbal meanings again this is the way how children learn l1 well my dear students during this period of 19th century that is from 1800s onwards and during the um the first half of the 20th century there were a lot of reforms when it comes to language teaching methods in the late 1800s and early 90s linguists became interested in the problem of the best way to teach languages these reforms the reformers included uh, henry swift of uh, england wilhelm wetter of germany and paul pessy of france and these were the people actually who believed that language teaching should be based on some kind of scientific knowledge they believed that it should begin with speaking they also believed that it should expand from speaking then to other skills they also had the view that language should be presented in context so the earlier ways of grammar translation method or the earlier ways of the teaching and learning of latin and greek languages where learning the rules in isolation was important this was for the first time challenged um and the view now was that grammar should be taught inductively and translation should be avoided at all so this was a complete reaction to the grammar translation method this that is what we call the direct method um was uh, actually the first of the natural methods that were uh, that was ever introduced during these times behaviorism and language teaching um you know um gained significance there were developments in other fields that had an effect on the teaching of language and one of the fields that uh, was prominent in this regard was psychology psychology or behaviorism um you know um the the idea of the the theory of behaviorism as it is presented by psychology psychologists had a great effect or impact on language learning in fact scientists in the early to mid 19 um 100 Uh, times did experiments with animals that how do animals learn and how it was then equated with how human beings learn there were various people for example ivan pavlov uh, uh, did various experiments he rang a bell before giving food to the dogs the dogs started salivating 
um, because they learnt that the bell is an announcement of the food to be served. And even before the food was presented, they were conditioned to this response um, in such a way that even if the food is not served after the bell, long before or long before that, they would start salivating. Ivan Pavlov and Skinner are important names with reference to behaviorism. They did experiments on animal behavior and it was formed by a series of rewards and punishments. Um, and through these experiments of reward and punishment, actually, it was found that it is the, that language is learning, learning a language is learning a behavior. In applying his principles to language, actually Skinner theorized that parents or other caretakers hear a child say something. For example, when a child says biscuit, that sounds like a word in their language, even if the child pronounces it like, for example, bicket, the word uh, as it sounds like a word in their language, uh, that is biscuit, they reward the child with attention and praise and often the child is given a biscuit as well. The child repeats the words and combinations of words in order to get this attention, this praise and this reward. Behaviorism along with applied linguistics which developed detailed descriptions of the differences between languages had a great influence on language teaching. Well, my dear students, theorists believed that languages were made up of a series of habits. Also, they believed that a contrastive analysis of languages would be invaluable, would be significant in teaching languages because it, uh, points in which the, the points in which the languages were similar would be easy for students to learn. The similarities of L1 and L2 would make the learning of L2 easy in other words. Now, from these theories arose the audiolingual method that was, ba that was based on use of drills for the formation of good language habits. Students would be given a stimulus, they would respond to that. If they respond to that correctly, they would be given a re reward for that. And thus a habit would be formed. If they would give an incorrect re response as a punishment to that, they would be suppressed. Gohan and Berlitz were the people who introduced the direct method and the last two decades of the 19th century assured um, uh, this in a new age. It was in 1880 that Francois Gohan um, did a harrowing of experiences of learning and, uh, you know, uh, provided certain insights into how language is learned. Living in Hamburg for one year and memorizing a German grammar book, he had his first-hand experience um, of learning an L2 and the list of the 248 irregular German verbs that he learned, um, you know, while he was not conversing with the natives. After his failure to memorize the German roots um, uh, and the realization that he had no success, he went so far as to memorize books, translate Goethe and Schiller, and learn by heart 30,000 words in a dictionary only to meet with that failure. But of course, this was a long and tedious process. Upon returning to France, his three-year-old nephew, a chatterbox of French, began observing his uh, uh, and uh, he began uh, observing this uh, nephew and the conclusion that he drew was language learning is a matter of transforming perceptions into conceptions and then using language to represent these conceptions because he learned all this from his own experience of learning German language in isolation. It was against this background that the series method was created which taught learners directly a series of connected sentences that are, that are easy to understand. For example, I stretch out my arm, I take hold of the handle, I turn the handle, I open the door, I pull the door. So this was a kind of example of series method. This approach was very short-lived and a generation later it gave place to the direct method which was uh, posited by Charles Burlitz. And the basic tenant of uh, this method was second language learning is similar to first language learning. There should be lots of oral interactions, spontaneous use of the language. There shouldn't be any translations. If there have to be, they have to be very little. And there shouldn't be any analysis of grammatical rules or syntactic structures. The direct method enjoyed a great popularity for some time, but it had its own problems like uh, um, the availability of budget and time and the overcrowded classrooms were the problems. This led way to the audiolingual method that was uh, an outbreak of World War II and it was basically 
presented to fulfill the needs of the Americans to become orally proficient in the languages of their allies as well as of their enemies. The audiolingual method was based on linguistic and psychological theories. It had certain characteristics, for example, uh, dependence on mimicry and memorization of set phrases. So learners would be made to learn certain phrases through, you know, drill, teaching structural patterns by means of repetitive drills, no grammatical explanations, and learning vocabulary, not in isolation, but in the context. Use of tapes and visual aids gave it actually the name of audio a lingual method. It focused on speaking, especially on pronunciation, with a reinforcement of the correct response. So it had taken certain features from the previous methods as well. But its popularity um, was like till 1964, and partially because of Wilga Rivers's exposure of its shortcomings, you know, it uh, it it faded away. It fell short of prompt, promoting communicative abilities in the students, and it paid more attention to drilling and to memorization of certain structures.